Okay, can everybody hear? I want to. I want to start because we're on a very, uh, very tight schedule today. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, I'm Laura Kogan, and I'm not going to introduce this panel very much because you're going to hear from me later today on the, on the visualization panel. So um, I'm here to introduce and moderate this next panel on climate change. I'm very excited about it because it's actually four people I've never met and always wanted to meet, so very happy about that. Um, so we also have... It's a very diverse panel intellectually. Richard Seeger, who's going to speak first, is a geoscientist um, at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observation, and I hope is going to talk today about a, a very influential um, article that he's written uh, on conflict and climate change, which was also in the New York Times recently, etc. Um, Saskia Sassen is a sociologist and also the chair here at Columbia of the Committee on Global Thought thought and has just written a great book called Expulsions, which deals with a, a lot of the topics you're going to hear about today. Uh, Christian Parenti, I don't know where you are, <laughs> but there you are, okay, teaches um, in, the, um, in the Global Liberal Studies Program at NYU and is also a journalist, and Michael Gerard. Um, here at Columbia in the Law School and also director of the Sabin Center for Climate Law. So I'm introducing them all together and I'll just remind you which one comes next. But Richard, we're looking forward to you first. Okay, do I, I, I get to advance this with this little machine here? Okay. All right, um, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. I am a uh, climate scientist here at Columbia University, one of um, hundreds of them who are actually work at various parts of the university here. Um, and I'm going to give a talk here about climate and social stability. I was never really quite sure what was going to be expected of me here. So, and what I put in the abstract is not exactly what I'll talk about. This is going to be a bit more general than just... Um, um, ongoing conflict now. So um, hopefully you'll find this interesting, but um, um, if you really want to read a, a good current review about um, the relationships between climate and conflict, there's a paper out by Solomon Shang, who used, who used to be here but is now at Berkeley, and Marshall Burke, and what they conclude, and this is a review from a review of quantitative studies, not anecdotal, but real um, quantitative studies, um, 50 of those they examined, and they find um, consistent support for a causal association between climatological changes and various conflict outcomes at spatial scales ranging from individual buildings to the entire globe, and at temporal scales ranging from an anomalous hour to an anomalous, anomalous millennium. So I think ground is shifting a little bit in the study of climate and conflict to find um, good quantitative evidence that climate events have contributed to um, historical conflicts. This is not um, something that is new um, to the world. This has been going on for a very long time, and um, I will talk actually not just about conflict, but social change um, overall, using some examples um, that actually cover the past five millennia, and these were um, rather casually chosen um, but it turns out they're all ones that, which um, were work that was done, um, at least in part, um, at Le Mont here, here at Columbia. So the first one is a rather strange climate event that happened 4.2 thousand years ago, the so-called 4.2K event. And this coincided with the fall of the Akkadian Empire, um, which was the first truly big um, empire to exist in, in the world. Um, and what is plotted here, this is work that was done by Heidi Cullen, a PhD student in our department, and Peter Domenico, who's um, Earth Institute faculty member, who is still here. And um, what they did was analyze sediments in the northern part of the Indian Ocean, and they found, if there's a pointer, yes there is, that around about this time, 4.2K, there was this dramatic increase in sedimentation of calcium carbonate 
and Dolomite, um, just a sudden event, those are sands that came into um, the northern, northern sea and they did the mineralogy to prove um, that those originated from the location of the empire, which is in current day Mesopotamia, in current day Iraq. And thus showing that there was this dramatic onset of aridification that lasted then for a, a century or so and then went away, not quite as abruptly as it, as it, as it began. This event um, was actually um, not, not just there. Um, Harvey Weiss at Yale University has studied this event um, across the world, and it seems to have been a dramatic onset of aridification across pretty much the whole northern hemisphere um, that occurred within a matter of a few years and then lasted for a few hundred years. I was, as a climate scientist, I was always very skeptical of this event because I could never see any way that the physical climate system could do something like this. This was well after the end of the Ice Age. This was in our, happened in, the, in our current climate state, essentially. And there's no known physical explanation for this. This is only one um, civilization collapse that it, it occurred. It also had major effects on civilizations in Egypt as well. So that's one. Um, more recently, um, there's a lot of work that has been done by our tree ring laboratory at Lamont on Southeast Asia. In this case, we're talking about records that go back just about a thousand years from living and archaeological wood. Brendan Buckley was the lead of that. And he um, pioneered the development of tree ring records of early, late spring, early summer monsoonal precipitation in, in tropical regions, working with records from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And what they found in this case was that um, the big hydraulic city, city of Angkor in Cambodia, which was rapidly abandoned um, several, several centuries ago, occurred following two extremely severe multi-decadal droughts that had to be sort of dramatic long-term monsoon failures that were then rapidly followed by a series of extreme high strong monsoons and flooding. And since the, the original paper was published by this a few years ago, there was a lot of work done in archaeological evidence looking at what happened at Angkor with a lot of aerial photographies and ground surveys. Um, this was a city that um, had an enormously developed um, water resource system to, con to control water for flooding, also to use water for, for human supply. Very um, elaborate canals and built. And there's a lot of evidence that came from this archaeological study that um, the water managers of Angkor made tremendous efforts to try to adapt to these persistent drought conditions. Um, but then, with only partial success, but then had to rapidly deal with flooding as well after the, the drought ended. But it didn't work. Eventually, they were unable to maintain this water supply, this water supply system, and they had to um, abandon the city. So, according to Brendan, the sequence of events that led to the fall of Angkor was mega droughts, first of all, um, stressing the agricultural systems, and then high magnitude rain events after that that destroyed infrastructure, and that's been seen from this archaeological evidence. The system broke, and the elites abandoned Angkor um, for coastal regions. It became um, more based around trade, leaving the peasantry to fend for themselves there. Um, this is the, the Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde, and we never published this result, but um, I got invited to an archaeological conference conference to talk about this, and um, it had long been thought that there may be a climate component to the abandonment of the ancestral Puebloan settlements in um, the southwest of the United States, and um, our colleagues at the Tree Ring Lab under the leadership of Ed Cook had recently developed new, extremely high-quality tree ring records of climate within the region. So we just simply got the, the data for the um, number of set habitation sites within the Four Corners region and plotted it together with the tree ring reconstructions 
of drought severity where brown is down. And you can see that the, the final collapse of this society, the abandonment in the, late 13, in the late 13th century, occurred during one of these very, very long, um, one, two decade long droughts. This is a time when it was overall drier in the southwest, um, but punctuated within that were some of these severe um, mega droughts as well. But it's clear that um, drought was not the only thing that, that was going on here because the, the population within this region went up and down and up and down and up and down. And it actually grew during some droughts, but then it finally terminated during this drought. So obviously there was quite a range of complex things going on here. Um, but for whatever reason, by the time it came to the 13th century, um, these, these societies were not able to withstand that drought and these cities were abandoned, um, never to be settled again. Moving into the 20th century, um, the biggest environmental disaster that's ever occurred in the United States is the Dust Bowl drought of the 1930s. This um, three million people left their homes at this time, uh, half a million of those in, ended up moving to other, other states. There um, were quite a lot of deaths associated with this from dust inhalation. Um, we know from a lot of climate modeling that we've done at Le Mont um, that the ultimate cause of this drought was a pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies, cold in the tropical Pacific Ocean. This is the sea surface temperature anomaly averaged over the 1930s, warm in the tropical North Atlantic. That's an ideal configuration of the tropical oceans to create dry con conditions across Western North America. Um, but we also know from modeling work we did in collaboration with, the, with NAS NASA, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, that the dust storms that occurred during this drought made that drought um, considerably worse than it otherwise would have been. If it had just been the ocean conditions, it would have been a more modest drought. But poor agricultural land use practices, essentially deep till plowing, planting of non-drought resistant wheat, um, and not leaving land fallow at all led to these tremendous dust storms. During the 1930s, the Great Plains was emitting dust at the rate that the Sahara is now. Um, and the dust storms interacted with radiation in the atmosphere in order to intensify the drought. So it was a coupled problem, a coupled um, climate, climate human interaction that led to the severity of the dust storm, the, of the dust bowl. Um, but the effects of the Dust Bowl apparently are still with us. Um, this fellow here, Hornbeck, who works for the National Agricultural Statistics, anyway, within the, some part of the um, federal government agricultural bureaucracy, did a rather clever um, econometric analysis of all sorts of quantities. And what I've just plotted here is a picture he had of land use prices where they tried to identify, looking at very areas that were heavily eroded and areas that were less eroded, they teased out the, the, the change in, 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 land, in land use price. And you can see that during the 30s, there was a dramatic decline in land use price that has continued to the very present day. This, the price went down because so much topsoil was eroded, and the price, the cost of that land has never recovered from that decades later. It also led to a, a dramatic shift in rural and urban population. The rural population collapsed in the 1930s and um, from that time on there was a, a shift towards a more urbanized population throughout the Great Plains states affected by the Dust Bowl. And also it led to a shift in farm size. Farm so the number of farms kept growing through to the 1930s. As soon as the Dust Bowl came along, the number of, farm the number of farms um, went down in size as, big, as farmers abandoned the land, larger farmers um, were able to, take, to buy up the land. So you had a structural change in, in, in the economy. Um, and it's still, the effects of that are still, go are still with us today. So what can, that was all, of course, due, due to um, natural climate variability um, and land use interaction in the case of the Dust Bowls. So but let's have a quick look at what's going to be going on um, now and in the future. So one of the main um, 
effects that climate change is going to have on people is via the change in hydroclimate, not just the warming of the planet, we all know about that, but the fact that rain bands and how much it's going to rain is going to change and is changing. So the world divides, whoops, sorry, the world divides up into dry regions in the subtropics and wet regions in the deep tropics and the higher latitudes. That's because of the movement of moisture within the atmosphere, within the trade winds and the westerlies. The primary effect of increasing, of warming, is that the atmosphere can hold more moisture. So those atmospheric transports of moisture intensify in a warmer climate. And when you look at the change in precipitation minus evaporation, so the net flux of water at the surface, dry regions tend to get drier and wet regions tend to get wetter as a result of climate change. It's a little difficult to see here, but you also find that the subtropical dry regions expand poleward as well. One of the reason, one of, let's just um, look at that in terms of, this is a, a measure of soil moisture. This is, comes from a recent paper by Ben Cook at NASA, Goddard Institute of Space Studies. The, and it's looking at the change of, at the end of this century in surface soil moisture relative to the 20th century. So you can see that it, the brown, of course, is a reduction. Pretty much all continental regions, apart from higher latitude regions where you have a in large increase in precipitation and some tropical regions, become drier as a consequence of, of both precipitation changes and a consequence of rising temperature extracting moisture from the surface. One of the places where this is expected to be particularly severe is in southern Europe, the Mediterranean region, and the, the Middle East. So to finish, I'll just talk briefly about Syria. Um, doesn't matter how you try to do the analysis, um, you come up with um, a pretty robust estimate that precipitation within the eastern Mediterranean region has been declining over the last several decades. These are decades prior to the uprising as a consequence of rising greenhouse gases. There has, the Mediterranean region is an area of very strong interannual variability and it has dry years and wet years and dry decades and wet decades. But there has been this long-term drying trend in the, in the east, in the eastern Mediterranean, that we were unable to explain in terms of natural climate variability. It, instead, it is very consistent with what we expect to happen as a consequence of rising greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So statistical analysis based on observations conclude that the drying in the east has been contributed to by human-induced climate change, and the climate model simulations done of the 20th, of the past, the 20th century and the past decade also say that rising greenhouse gases in that area should have led to aridification. And we have some reasonable physical ideas for why that is happening. Yeah. One of the areas where that has affected has been in Syria, where there was a long three-year drought in the years preceding the, the upwelling, the, the uprising. This is a timeline, therefore, of what happened. Um, this is the change in urban population within, within Syria. So, of course, Syria had a, a, absorbed about one and a half million refugees from the war in Iraq. Um, and then this drought in the northern part of Syria, it was key that it lasted three years. Um, one year drought, two year drought, most farming communities can survive, but a three year drought, resources were um, eliminated and they had no choice to leave the land. The exact number of people who've migrated within Syria from rural areas to cities is not uh, known, um, but the numbers potentially reach as high as one and a half million. And this led to a tremendous um, increase in stress within the cities on food prices, employment, housing prices, school systems, ed uh, health systems, all of which the Syrian government did nothing to alleviate, and this was one factor um, that contributed to the uprising um, that occurred. Not the only one, but one, but one. Prince Charles talked about this recently two years ago. I just mentioned that because I know how much architects and urban planners admire <laughs> Prince Charles. So, so, I don't know why, I think, I think after this I just went to my, it's stuck, but um, 
Anyway, I think there was just a, a conclusion slide that um, came, came along after this. It's interesting, in all of the cases I, I um, presented here, the way that climate change was impacting human society was through agricultural communities. I don't know of a clear-cut case like this where the climate impact um, went directly on went directly onto a city. Um, obviously, there have been, you know, um, Sandy and Katrina, you could, you could list, not related to climate change primarily, but you could list those. But for these ones, it was working through a much wide, you know, through agricultural communities and then subsequently onto, onto cities. But as we look to the future, um, but there are many more sort of um, um, examples, rising sea level, coastal flooding, cyclones, water supply, heat waves, air quality crises, where you can imagine that clim climate change is going to have directly impact on cities. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Do we have the first slide? Okay, I'm just going to start. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here once again at Avery Hall, and I love the conferences here. This is an extraordinary mix of knowledges, all sort of engaging a massive challenge that we face. Um, three vectors that I want to very, very quickly develop that make cities today, especially larger cities probably, strategic sites where massive challenges materialize, often in very extreme forms. Cities are not the only site, but they are a very particular kind of site. So the first one is asymmetric war. Asymmetric war tends to urbanize war. Urban space becomes a technology for war. Um, and furthermore, what is actually terribly disturbing, these are wars without end. No armistice is possible. It's not like you have a hegemon. The US is no longer a hegemon. There are no you know, big powers that can sit around the table and say, OK, war is over. After five years of war, let's go to business, back to business. It doesn't exist. So this means that cities have, this is, this is going to be a fairly long history, I'm afraid. And it's very, very disturbing. And we, I don't need to cite the sort of the latest incidents. But, and it also means that when a national government says, I'm going to war in the name of national security, one should immediately put beneath it and urban insecurity. You understand? So, so I just want to put that on the table. It's not quite related to climate change, but I think it is one of those ways in which the city becomes a strategic space. The second one is the city emerges as one of the final places given a massive, for people to go to, given a massive loss of habitat. War is one mode in which habitat as a place where people can live or make life disappears. Um, but there are many others. There are massive land grabs in the global south. You know, the figures are rather stunning at least 300 million hectares have been bought by about 15 countries, acquired is actually the proper term here, have been acquired by about 15 countries that are major buyers. And, and that includes some very nice countries, by the way. It's not only the baddies or whatever people sometimes think. And, um, and about 100 plus major firms. The mode in which that lands land gets used, and I just mentioned, by the way, agricultural land. I'm not talking about mining, which is also a massive uh, sort of extractive, brutal expansion that destroys land. But uh, in the case of agricultural land, you replace smallholder agriculture with farmers, you know, growers who know how to keep the earth alive for a long time with plantation, which destroys the land. It destroys the land rather quickly, Dead land is the result, hence they're going to be buying more. So this is also a trend, like it's like a vector that is just taking off. Um, where do people go confronted with these kinds of things? Well, you know, the cities become really one of the last places where they can go. 
Now, this, the, the, the destruction of, of uh, the environment, both through war and through this kind of land grabs, is astounding. Now, I, very quickly, what I wanted to do next is to, uh, is this going to move or not? Hello. So, there, so I want to start with this image we make. And let me assure you that I'm meaning it ironically, all right? I don't mean it as the maker's movement. That is not what I have in mind. So <laughs> this likes to take its time, or am I pointing to the wrong place? We make, in 20 years, we managed to make this, destroy one of the biggest interior seas, and reduce it to a sliver. I want to stand back and say, this is a capability. It's clearly not a capability, a la Martia Sen. And why should the word capability have this embedded positive notion? Right? It, it does have that embedded positive notion. But I want to sort of free it up and to say, if we can make this, or, can somebody tell me where, okay, um, where I point, you know? So we also made that. After millions of years, we managed poof like that. So we have to really stand back and to say, wow. We deploy extraordinary capabilities, and we have deployed them in so many different ways. Can we actually manage to transform that capacity to make you know, vast outcomes into positives? I'm not going to give you the, the answer to that. Eh? That is not. I want to move on, because the third way in which we are messing up stuff, and this is just, OK, this thing is playing with me. This is just a little internal a little internal stuff about cities and so i'm looking at uh, foreign foreign and national buying of property and these are just a few examples um, i should actually back up before well uh, that are resulting in massive sort of mega projects that are actually, besides de-urbanizing urban space, are of course becoming extremely destructive, environmentally speaking. My image of the city is that the city, every surface in the city should be working with the environment. And there are, from biology, from material science, there are so many good discoveries, innovations, how to deploy bacteria, algae, mushrooms, all kinds of new technological devices. And this kind of, of uh, investment is rather problematic. Now, this is just one year. I just want to, to, to dwell a bit on this. So this is one year. The, the, the top, I'm looking at the top 100 cities and that are recipients of this kind of investment. This is only about buying property. So this is national and foreign, as you can see, but the list goes on. If I showed the 100, you know, it would go around the room, so to say. And this, where do I point? Okay, so here you have sort of a better distribution. You can see that it's a mix of cities, if you consider the 100, and very extreme at the top. Okay, pardon? Well, let's just you know, not interrupt too much here. So t this is foreign investment. Now, as you see, London is the queen here. So many people uh, think that this is sort of gentrification. And I'm, now I want to get at questions of language and categories for analyses. Of course, there is a bit of gentrification in that. But we are really witnessing, I think, an emergent history. And I sort of like actually to juxtapose two emergent histories. One is connected to this kind of stuff. And here, uh, one little illustration to signal that we're dealing with something different. The Qatari royals own more of central London now than the Queen of England, Pace, the Duke, the famous Duke, owns even more than both of them. But the point here is when you're dealing with that kind of powerful, and there is a lot of this going on, with those kinds of powerful actors, to use the term gentrification, is not enough. We need other categories. The, the second one where I, where I have this sort of, uh, you know, want to argue that we don't have the right categories is when we describe the migration crisis, the refugee crisis that we're seeing in Europe, it's also happening in other parts of the world, uh, as, you know, the, the categories migration and refugees 
capture something, but they don't capture, I think, what is a far more significant trend, which is that massive loss of habitat that I was talking about. We need new language to capture some of these extraordinary conditions that are emerging that have to do with environmental destruction, that have to do with war, and with a whole variety of sort of economic processes. Now, let me continue with this. Uh, okay, there we go. So here again, you can see, you know, this distribution of cities, and I, um, the data, let's see, I think I have the data for two years. So the year, the mid-13 mid to mid-14, those top 100 cities received $600 billion in investment, national and foreign, for, oh, I, okay. This is just a little illustration that I wanted to throw in. This happens to be sort of buildings that the Chinese investors bought. And you can see they have fairly good taste. They sort of bought a whole, you know, London is really, but they are also, you know, buying all over. By the way, I don't have anything in foreign investment. For me, the, the issue is corporate investment. And those figures that I've been showing you, minimum investment is five billion dollars. So we, five million, I'm sorry. So we're not speaking, you know, little cute thingies. Um, and, and this is what they're doing in Atlantic Yards, which is not good taste, I would say. This is massive, this is environmentally destructive, etc. cetera. Um, they have evidently called it, they want to give it a more elegant name, so they are calling it uh, Pacific Yards or something like that. <laughs> I found that very, I don't know. There is actually a Pacific Avenue around, so maybe that is it. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Atlantic Yards is one of the big sites that remain undeveloped. I mean, in this audience, you probably know, I don't want to develop that. They're going to replace it with 14 massive towers. This is what we are doing in our cities, which means a truly a de-urbanizing. And if you de-urbanize, you're also removing those capabilities that urban space has, you know, to, I always like to, to say that the city is a complex but incomplete system. And in that mix of complexity and incompleteness lies its capacity to outlive all kinds of other th systems, m far more powerful but closed. So think of all the multinational corporations or power, not multinational, just corporations, powerful corporations, powerful governments, powerful kings and queens that are no longer with us, but the cities where they lived and functioned are still with us. I think that's a very important data. But when we begin to transform our cities into this, we are running into trouble. I argue that this adds density, but actually de-urbanizes. So the question of density is not enough to mark urban space. And in there, for me, lies a whole environmental story. This is very difficult to make it work with the environment, where there's all kinds of construction. And, and some people have shown that you can achieve same densities, but with far more manageable sort of built environments. Now, let's see. Ah, okay, so I meant to end now, I'm sorry. I just forgot my own, uh, I was so engaged in this. So, so the main, and I see that I'm running out of time. So the main point that I want to make is that I think the city uh, becomes a strategic site given a whole range of calamities, if you want, you know, negative outcomes from our actions or from other actions. I was very interested in the presenter who just presented that a lot of environmental destruction was happening long before sort of we had the kind of industrial economy that we have now. But we certainly are adding enormously. That is very, very clear. We also know that that what is being discussed in terms of addressing uh, climate change and cities is not enough. There are very, very interesting graphs that show even if we implemented all the policies around which there is a consensus, we would not make much of a difference. So I think that thinking of urban space as having surfaces, I don't know about this kind of surface, but surfaces where you can actually deploy uh, all kinds of, you know, the famous bacteria, you know, that seals off greenhouse gases. When you think of this new bacteria that they discovered, which if you put it in brown organic waters, it produces a molecule of a plastic, durable, resistant, but biodegradable. Imagine it recodes a big negative, a burden for cities, 
usually badly disposed of into a positive. You know, you either sell them the, the prime matter, so to say, the brown organic waters to whoever wants to transform it into a positive, or you do it yourself and you export the plastic. So that is sort of my notion of how the city can become and must become, I would argue, a critical space for transformations. But right now, those three vectors that I mentioned, uh, asymmetric war, the massive loss of habitat, which is going to create massive migrations into cities, uh, and the way in which we are missing categories that capture these kinds of combinations that cut across existing domains for knowledge and for specialized sort of uh, knowledges as well. That has me very worried, and I see that as an agenda. It's not just about policy. It's, it has to bring in the sciences. It has to bring in sort of a larger global understanding. There is a global space that needs to be brought into the discussion, and it can not just be you know, the city by itself. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Christian Parenti, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint uh, presentation for two reasons. Well, yes, and there are two reasons for that. One, because I'm lazy, and two, because power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, as they say. <laughs> but that said, actually, I thought some of the PowerPoints today were really, really beautiful and, and, and have been making me rethink uh, the use of PowerPoint. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about the centrality of the state and making a case for the, you, the necessity of engaging the state and reforming the state to deal with the crisis of climate change. This comes directly out of my last book, which was something of the opposite. It was, uh, it's called Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change in the New Geography of Violence, and it was an attempt at some sort of left environmental intervention into the problem of state failure and open-ended global counterinsurgency that Saskia uh, mentioned and others have, have hinted at aspects of that. Um, and part of what motivates me in, in uh, thinking about the state and making the case for the state is that it seems that one of the effects of neoliberalism has been to essentially disappear the state as a category. And it is frequently just dismissed as sort of antiquated and and uh, not something that deserves serious attention. So if we think about climate change, we have to think about climate science, right? And the climate science is very dire. Um, I'm sure you all know this stuff, but it's worth just re-mentioning the, the, the essentials, right? The, the issue of time frames and tipping points, thresholds and tipping points is really important. There is uh, it's clear now that the climate system does not change in a linear, linear fashion. There are sudden transformations of the climate regime. This was a sort of marginal theory in science in the 1980s, and this has been revealed in the historical record and sediments, uh, et cetera, that you know, the climate regime suddenly can switch. That causes buildup, effects lag, and then the effects kick in all at once. As it is, the standard numbers around the kind of decarbonization we have to do are on the order of 10% per annum um, for you know, the next several decades to avoid the worst of this, where the, uh, the, the sort of standard you know, threshold is 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're now at 405 parts per million. So given that time frame, another problem is I think that people who understand the climate science uh, become cynical because it is hard to take seriously a lot of the proposals that are um, put out in relationship to that time frame. So I, I think it's important to make a credible case for survival. A credible case for survival is not a particularly um, visionary or romantic one. It is uh, you know, just uh, good old reformist politics but with a sense of emergency. So the state, 
The state can and must drive decarbonization because decarbonization essentially involves some sort of reindustrialization. And if you look at the history of industrialization, there isn't a single case that I can think of where the, the capitalist state or a socialist state, but stick with the capitalist system since, since that's what we have now, where the capitalist state isn't central in driving industrialization. So in terms of the climate discourse of adaptation and mitigation, if mitigation means reindustrialization, the state has to play an enormously important role in that. And in terms of uh, thinking about this, American history is quite revealing in terms of bringing out uh, the shadow socialism, the sort of hidden in plain sight centrality of the state. Earlier industrialization in the UK also depended on state intervention. Even Adam Smith sort of acknowledges this in the middle of Wealth of Nations, you know, that, okay, well, the Navigation Acts, that's okay. There's certain things where the state can intervene. They happen to be, you know, the central elements of the economy that helped drive mercantilist England towards industrialization. But in the United States, uh, this also, uh, a larger point first, you know, this might seem like a new role, right, uh, that the state has to take on this environmental mission. But it's actually not a new role because uh, following from Jason Moore, who Greg uh, Mittman mentioned, capitalism doesn't have an ecological regime. It is an ecological regime. Well, so too with the capitalist state. Uh, the, the, the capitalist state doesn't have an ecological regime. It is an ecological regime. And this is revealed in the fact that it is territory, right? Think about the classic Weberian definition of the state. It's the, the human community that has the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. And then he says, note that territory is a key feature of the modern state. Well, where is extra human nature on the surface of the earth? In the modern era, what institutions ultimately control the surface of the earth? States. There are lawless places, but ultimately states control most of the surface of the earth. And when we think about how, na how capitalism accesses nature, broadly defined, meaning human beings and extra human nature, it is almost always with the assistance of the state. The state delivers nature to production by seizing it and bounding it, by uh, distributing it, by knowing it, analyzing it, and measuring it, and by opening it through the production of infrastructure, which is absolutely essential. The public provision of infrastructure is absolutely essential to the rise of capitalism globally. So in terms of American history, this becomes really important. You look at the uh, report on manufacturers by Alexander Hamilton is really the blueprint for how the US is going to industrialize. We don't read it in this country very much, but in East Asia it's taken seriously, and it really kind of laid out the template that all developmentalist states followed, even developmentalist states that didn't call themselves that. And Hamilton lays out what he calls the means proper to bring the U.S. from an agrarian periphery with some manufacturing to a, a fully you know, industrialized economy. He doesn't use that word, he talks about manufacturers so as to pay for defense against all comers, including the UK. So he advocated for tariffs, subsidies, public investment in infrastructure or internal improvements, as he put it, public uh, uh, financing of a central bank and uh, centralized management of a credit system, and public government subsidy for science. This agenda put forward in 1791 in the report on manufacturers was largely defeated at first by the South. The South was afraid of federal power for its threatened plantation power, uh, which is what hides behind states' rights. Nonetheless, a lot of Hamilton's vision is implemented at the state level, and then later uh, Henry Clay takes up the challenge, uh, the ideas. Hamilton's, Hamilton's ideas are known as the American School. In the hands of Henry Clay, they become the American system. And this actually, very interestingly, influences Frederick List, who takes this to Germany, where it becomes the national system. And Hamilton's infant manufacturers become List's infant industries. So what happens in the US is the federal government is crucial in 
providing land for the creation of the Erie Canal and then all of the other canals. It um, subsidizes the construction of the road system through the post office. It uh, clears hundreds and hundreds, thousands of miles <coughs> of rivers for navigation. We think of rivers as pre-existing passive features of the landscape that steamboats went up and down, and they actually had to be managed very actively. They were extremely dangerous until the federal government invested enormous sums of money in clearing snags from them. Railroads similarly. There's not a single railroad in the United States that's not built with massive gifts of public land. This allowed the investors to then borrow money on the open market. They had this land as collateral and thus to build the railroads. And you can follow this pattern all the way through to the iPhone. Mariana Mazzucuto illustrates well in her book uh, you know, that there are 12 different technologies that the iPhone depends on, all of which are the product of government intervention. And not just government subsidy for R&D, but also government acting as the first consumer of technology, which allows the private sector to achieve economies of scale that lower the price so that these technologies can then become uh, regular features of our life. The, you know, the, the, the kind of hidden developmentalism of the American state is uh, in Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution, actually. You know, we always talk about how the Constitution is about, it sort of describes how government works, but Article 1, Section 8, which is often overlooked as well, illustrates what the government can do, and it's amazing. It's like pretty much everything. It's set weights and measures, uh, you know, deal with uh, bankruptcies, build, you know, build roads, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, in fact, how the U.S. has developed a state that doesn't have an environmental regime, but is an environmental regime. That, it, that, that, that developing the landscape, developing nature, it has always been the central task of particularly the American state, but, but similarly with other states. This brings up a deeper question, right, which is our place in nature. This gets back to Jason Moore's um, insistence on that we un you know, get beyond the Cartesian dualism of nature society. And I think that's very important because if we think of nature as other and that human society are the intruders, then the implied solution is that we retreat. And that feeds cynicism because it's not realistic, right? People, people can't look at the kinds of images they've seen today and then think that a kind of updated conservationist mentality or plan is going to work. We have to realize that we create nature and we don't just, we create environments. We're an environment making species. And that doesn't mean we just despoil the, the place, but we have a long record of also creating biodiversity, right? There's a increasingly good literature on the role of people in creating biodiversity in tropical forests. A new book out, The Social Lives of Forests, gets into that very well. Where you look at the environmental history of this continent before European settlement. Native Americans didn't domesticate animals as much as Europeans, but they absolutely domesticated the landscape. In this part of the country, Native Americans burnt the landscape twice a year, every year, to create edge habitat to increase the, the amount of game and, and so as to harvest it. So our environment making is not just destructive, it, it is also creative in the sense of increasing life. So how are we to do take these lessons and deal with climate change now. Well, the state has to drive capitalism to decarbonize. If that happened, it would not solve the environmental crisis. It would merely buy time to deal with all of the other crises because climate change is the most pressing. And even here in the United States, we have actually everything we need to do that. We have the laws, we have the technology, and we have the money. The laws are the Clean Air Act of 1970, as, long, as well as the, the other uh, laws that the EPA is tasked with enforcing. But the Clean Air Act is modified by a lawsuit called Massachusetts versus EPA. And that lawsuit says that, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said the EPA must regulate greenhouse gas emissions. That was in 2007. We have been waiting since then for about 20 different tailoring rules that would uh, effectively impose a de facto carbon tax on the US economy. Once these rules, we've gotten two of them so far from the Obama administration, they're working on the third one, which is what will be permissible admissions for existing coal-fired power plants. If all of these rules had been aggressively promulgated, 
there would be a de facto carbon tax in that industry would be free to burn fossil fuels, but they would have to pay enormous fines in doing so. That would raise the cost of dirty energy and thereby indirectly lower the cost of clean energy. In terms of the technology, we have the grid, right? We have electric vehicles. It's not like we don't have to invest, invent these things. In terms of money, there is the, uh, the role of the state as consumer, right? The public sector is about 38, 35 to 38% of the US economy. Now, a lot of that is wages, but a lot of that is also paying for buildings, paying for heating and lighting buildings, uh, managing vehicles. And if the federal government and state governments took their role as consumers seriously, they could also drive the clean tech transformation very rapidly. The federal government has 450 mostly large, totally inefficient office buildings. If they committed to retrofitting that, that would create uh, an industry that would no doubt have skills and uh, you know, have achieved economies of scale that would be appealing to not just boutique experiments like the, the um, rather amazing retrofitting of the Empire State Building, but would go much more broadly. The post office has about like 140 vehicles. Uh, 140,000 vehicles, the average one of which travels only 18 miles a day, parks in the same place every night. No reason they shouldn't be electrified. The federal government is going to buy electricity, it is going to buy new vehicles, and it also has very strict rules about um, how and what it should purchase. We have stricter national origin purchasing rules than China or France. So we have that pool of capital, or of money, and my time is up, but there's one last thing, also, the private sector is sitting on $5 trillion of uninvested cash. This is not money paid out to shareholders or uh, as in bonuses. This is money retained by firms in uh, safe assets, with, and they're waiting for the next queue. Where, what's the big thing? If movements pressured the government to do the things I've been describing, that would usher a lot of that capital into building out a renewable energy system and a renewable transportation system. So in closing, the point is I think that it is actually really doable to deal with this problem that climate change is, seems apocalyptic, seems like the, can be confused with the entire environmental crisis because its implications are so apocalyptic, but it's actually a subset that is manageable and that articulating a plan that will work in real time with these institutions, as flawed as they are, is probably one of the best things that can be done to combat cynicism. And if that can happen, then we can really think about movements that are capable of pressuring states to do these things. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Michael Gerard from the, uh, the law school. What I'm going to be talking about is what governance of climate change has accomplished and where it is taking us, what scales of governance we need, and what systems of legal accountability do we have. That's not mine. Uh, so uh, the governance of climate change can be uh, uh, measured back to 1992, nearly a quarter century ago with the adoption of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and there is a real question about what do we have to show for it. The 1992 convention set up the objective of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with a climate system. It did not say how to do that. That was left to annual conferences of the parties. Uh, the most important of those was in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan, leading to the Kyoto Protocol. The objective of the Kyoto Protocol was by 2008 to 2012 to reduce uh, global emissions 5% below their 1990 levels. So in terms of the developed countries that signed on to the protocol, we didn't quite accomplish that, but we came close. Uh, we see that the emissions uh, were uh, uh, about the same level as uh, 1990 uh, by 2010. They weren't below it. Uh, 
But that was just the countries that signed on and that had obligations. When you look at the whole world, we see we kept on going up and up and up. Now, we, know, we knew that uh, a successor was going to be needed to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, and the decision was that, that a massive new major uh, uh, system of governance would be devised in Copenhagen in 2009. The conference happened in 2009, but this wonderful new agreement was not reached. The Copenhagen conference was in many ways a failure, but one thing that it did lead to was the global objective that the maximum tolerable increase in global average temperatures was 2 degrees centigrade, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial conditions. Now that uh, 2 degrees uh, was uh, a controversial number, uh, the small island nations wanted it to be one and a half degrees. Uh, tonight I'm flying to Paris to uh, be part of the delegation of the Republic of the Marshall Islands to COP21. And many of you saw a couple of days ago the front page story in the New York Times about the Marshall Islands indicating that at two degrees they are underwater. So are many of the other uh, small island uh, nations, so are significant parts of Bangladesh and other parts of the world. But uh, two degrees was the objective that was, uh, that was set in Copenhagen. Uh, to put this in, uh, in a long-term perspective, we've heard a lot about history and prehistory today. I'm going to go back to geologic history. And go this goes back 20,000 years. Uh, human civilization arose during the Holocene period going back 10 or 11,000 years. And this is uh, a global temperatures normalized in particular ways. Obviously, there are geographic differences, there are seasonal differences, there are year-to-year -year differences, but when you smooth it all out, you see that human civilization developed during a fairly narrow range, and that's the sea levels that formed where our cities are located and our agricultural patterns, our patterns of where we get water, all of that. We have now moved outside of that range and two degrees is well outside of that range. Uh, two degrees takes us into a realm where, which has never previously been encountered by humanity, and that is the objective. So where do we stand in uh, being at two degrees? Um, this is a chart going out to 2100 with global emissions. In order to be at two degrees, uh, we need to be at this bottom line uh, which is a si very significant decline in emissions. Uh, the blue line at the top is where we have been going. That's continuation as business as usual. And the Paris conference, uh, ongoing now, uh, is going to lead to a set of voluntary non-binding commitments that so far look like they take us around three and a half degrees. We'll see in the next week if any of them get more ambitious. Uh, but there is a very significant question about whether we're, gonna, whether we're even going to be at two degrees. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of projections about what happens with global sea levels depending on various emissions scenarios. The top one here is a continuation of business as usual. But this is far from the worst case scenario. A number of studies have been done. And a year and a half ago, the New York State Legislature adopted a law requiring the State Department of Environmental Conservation to come up with official projections as to future sea levels to be incorporated in a number of planning processes in the state. Uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation published its proposal a few weeks ago. They're having a hearing on it uh, at the end of December. And their proposal is that uh, one look at a six-foot rise by the end of this century, since there is about a 10% chance that the seas will be six feet higher at the end of the century. That's the number that ought to be used in various planning processes. Now, in a room full of architects and planners, I think it's important to think about what does uh, planning for a six-foot rise in sea levels by the end of the century mean. Uh, but that's going to have to be thought about as part of the planning processes if this regulation goes through, which it looks like it probably will. Let me skip over these. There are, uh, as Christian said, technological ways to uh, stay within uh, two degrees. This is a, 
scenario from the International Energy Agency with how the energy system of the globe uh, could be transformed to be on a two degree plat uh, pathway. Uh, it requires large amounts of carbon capture and sequestration, a technology that is still at its very early stages, massive amounts of renewables, nuclear, uh, fuel switching, uh, this largely assumes from coal to natural gas and a great deal of energy efficiency. Uh, one of the most detailed scenarios is from the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, uh, which is done by some people affiliated with, with Columbia and others. And they have this uh, scenario for what the emissions picture out to the end of the century would look like for a two degree pathway. And so we see on top is the overall global uh, emissions and then the, their allocation for each country. The, 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 the one at the bottom, of course, is China. China has committed to its greenhouse gas emissions peaking in 2030. That's what this shows. Then you have India, whose population is going to exceed that of China around 2022, which has enormous implications in many ways. And then above is the U.S. And you see what has to happen to the total greenhouse gas emissions in the United States out to the end of the century. It is a massive reduction would be, uh, would be necessary. Um, and in order to do that, this, this project has looked at the number of facilities, uh, uh, gr renewable energy facilities that would be needed Nuclear facilities, if we're going to use nuclear, if you don't want to use nuclear, that's fine, but you have to increase the amount of renewables. And this is on top of a very aggressive program of energy efficiency. And so if you look at the numbers at the lower left, it's the number of major new facilities that will be needed every year from 2016 through 2050. So, for example, every year from 2016 to 2050, under this scenario, we need about 100 large wind farms the size of the Cape Wind Project, which went through the permitting and litigation process for 15 years and never got built. So, uh, under the, uh, although it is true, I suppose, that in theory the current legal system uh, could drive us a, c a considerable way it's my own view that the current legal system will not get us there and we need significant changes in the law beyond what the, uh, uh, is now on the books in order to achieve this massive program. I think reindustrialization is a fair term for it. Um, so coming out of Paris, um, the conference is supposed to end a week from today, may go on another day or two. We'll have these bottom-up uh, pledges, which there'll be mandatory reporting and monitoring, but the emissions reductions that are pledged are completely voluntary and unenforceable. Uh, they'll be done at a national scale. Countries will probably be able to withdraw without penalty, which Canada did a couple years ago. Looks like they're now getting back into it. Um, and uh, the pledges, as I said, will, end, will lead to a world far warmer than two degrees. So there are a number of actions that I think are all imperative if we are going to um, avoid the worst effects of climate change and they are happening at, they happen at different scales. So the one where we do have effective global governance is reduction in the ozone depleting substances. The Montreal Protocol has been fabulously successful. Uh, it's being expanded to cover more uh, chemicals. Uh, we need, as, as uh, you heard before, to uh, deal with the situation that there will be absolutely massive numbers of people displaced by climate change, uh, uh, particularly in the latter part of this uh, century. We uh, saw the horrible situation with, in, in Europe with how difficult it was to deal with that number of people who were uh, displaced uh, by a combination of politics and, as Richard indicated, climate change, um, and has caused some political destabilization in Europe. That is a magnitude that is a fraction of, a, of what is likely to happen toward the end of the century as a result of climate change. At the national level, we need very large amounts of money to, from the global north to the global south to help prepare, uh, adapt to the climate change that is happening. Uh, we need to leave many of the fossil fuels that we have in the ground. That would be at the national level, but there's no legal system at all to do that. We need a great improvement in vehicle emission standards, stronger energy efficiency standards. All of this 
would have to be done at the national level. All of it at the U.S. national level is being mightily resisted by the Congress of the United States. We now have a House and a Senate that are both controlled by a faction that is doing everything it can to prevent a solution to this problem and to deny the reality of it. The, uh, and my own view is that the most important thing that Americans can do about uh, uh, climate change uh, at this point is to make sure that the next president believes in and confronts climate change does not deny it. Because if the wrong person gets in, uh, there is no hope that we will be able to, uh, to deal with any of this and changes in Congress are, are necessary. Um, so we also need a lot of technological development, much more renewables, carbon capture and sequestration. And here you have all different scales, active, national, subnational, private. There was an, an important announcement led by Bill Gates a couple of uh, days ago in Paris about a lot of private money going into uh, renewables uh, development. Uh, uh, we need uh, many actions on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, closing coal-fired, the old coal-fired power plants, installing new renewable capacity, reducing deforestation, at least that's not mostly a U.S. problem, building codes, adaptation planning, things that all of you are very expert in, and mostly at the local level, uh, uh, realizing that with the anticipated rise in sea level, or at least the uh, significant risk of a very high rise in sea level, we can't be continuing to develop and build and rebuild along the coastlines, but almost no local government has been willing to, uh, uh, to tackle that issue. Um, finally, what are the legal accountability measures, uh, mechanisms that are available to issue court orders or to impose penalties? Uh, the short answer is not many. Uh, so with reporting and monitoring, we, deal, we do have a system that countries are supposed to report what their emissions are and what they're doing about them. Uh, in terms of making countries pay for the uh, damage that is caused by the greenhouse gas emissions that they have historically dumped into the atmosphere and what is still there, we don't have anything that would accomplish that. Uh, the, uh, many of the least developed countries are calling for something called a loss and damage mechanism. That's very much on the agenda in Paris. But none of the countries that would have to actually write the checks have any interest at all in writing checks, and they can't be forced to. Uh, ongoing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, there is very little ability for courts to deal with that. Uh, there are many other things here that, uh, that uh, have been tried and are available at a very small scale. Um, and in the remaining seconds I have, I just want to go to the very last line here, which is that there is growing uh, 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 possibility that architects and engineers and planners and builders can be held liable if they do not prepare for and guard what they design and build against foreseeable climate conditions. There have been a number of cases where architects and builders and engineers have been held legally liable when the structures they were responsible for did not withstand uh, flooding conditions that were foreseen. We can now foresee a lot of flooding conditions. And so I think one of the great challenges facing uh, these professions going forward is how to, uh, how to prepare for the uh, future uh, climate change, the sea level, the extreme temperatures, the other things that are absolutely coming in the decades to come. Thank you. failure that there's no way I can bring all of the four, um, the four presentations together. But I think what's been really amazing is that 
each of the panelists has tried to address us as a, as a group of architects and builders and thinkers about the, about the built environment, which has, been, um, which has been great. So I think your presentation was really sobering um, <laughs> because it, you know, it does, it, 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 it's, it's showing a, a lot of the failures that are taking place. But I, I would just be curious since we do have, I'm only gonna ask one question because we've got 10 minutes and I do wanna open it up to the audience. But I'm just curious about, Richard, what your take is as a scientist on what the three more, you know, obviously policy oriented or, uh, you know, sociologically oriented um, uh, takes on the science that you're presenting. And I thought it was really interesting that you took the most historical uh, look um, at, the, at the topic. So, of course, you know, history and politics are always connected. But I, I just, I would like to address that first question to you and then see how the panel responds to that and then open it to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I very much liked the, the message that Christian presented, and I think that, you know, realizing the extent to which, I mean, I'm a climate scientist, but I'm a political animal, and um, the extent to which um, de economic development in the United States has critically involved the government historically, and, um, you know, again, he, I think Christian was very correct to identify a possible way that that power can be used again to, for a transition to beyond a carbon-based um, e economy. So um, the, the political reality of whether we can actually do that in, in this political system, um, of course, as Michael pointed out, we're in, a, we're in a terrible situation here that, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have another Democratic president and all of the remaining three candidates have, have incredibly good messages on, on climate change and what needs to be done, but the chances of them being, of the Democrats being able to get back um, the Houses of Congress and actually do any of that uh, uh, look remarkably slim. So it's, it's, a, it's a really frightening situation within the United States. And you know, Michael's, um, you know, pointed out all the, the legal regulations that have now gone in as a result of the, the Clean Air Act, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Clean Air Act a few years ago, but all of those regulations, of course, are going to be open to political threat too. So um, I know we've got re climate scientists got referred to as cynical when looking at the problems ahead and whether we can deal with that, but let's not be cynical, but let's, but we have to face up to a tremendously difficult um, path ahead in, in, within the United States. Do you have any, do you want to respond in, oh, I can, yeah. Um, I, I hope, uh, Richard, that on the presidential side, your uh, political prognostication is as accurate as your climate pr prognostication. <laughs> um, although I, th I think there is a, a real chance that the Senate may flip. Uh, uh, which we still, Congress has not enacted a major new environmental law in 25 years. We are paralyzed. Uh, uh, there is so much of a, uh, a partisan divide and there is no end in sight to that, which means that the administration, if we do have an administration that is inclined to deal with the issue, which the current one is and the last one wasn't, um, there's a lot that can be done, but not nearly as much uh, as if we had a to the rational Congress that we're uh, dealing in a serious way. Uh, so Paul Krugman had a terrific column this morning in the New York Times, somebody already alluded to it, but that the uh, current Congress is the principal impediment to a global solution to uh, climate change, which is quite tragic. I would definitely not wait till we have the right politicians. I think we have to do work now and this room probably has quite a few people who are working on cities, and the city is a strategic place to start working. And all kinds of people are working. It's like an invisible network of minor interventions. We need to scale them up, we need to expand them, and these transversal collaborations, I'm involved in some of them, with biologists, with material science people, with some people who do digital applications that are really working towards enabling, there is a lot of work to be done. And frankly, I think 
certainly this state, even if it were Democrats, I mean, they're very timid. That's a very kind language to use. Uh, so I, I really think we, we, we have got to get rid of this notion that the state is going to be the big mama, you know, who's going to get us all going. I really don't, don't think that that's... A, I mean, I agree with what you said. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But I think there is so much work to be done, and there is so much that we could do right now. And in fact, that is already being done. And one issue for me is that we should give far more visibility to this multiplication of minor interventions that are happening right now, which are very applied interventions, because it is then a model, it's a demonstration. Now, European countries are doing much better, you know, state-wise. The states are a bit more involved. But this country is particularly, I would say, difficult, you know? I'm Dutch, so the Netherlands is actually way ahead, I would say, <laughs> of the United States, you know, when it comes to the state and the environmental question. I think in terms of politics, the key thing is to realize and be honest that we are not going to get climate legislation. There will, there will not be climate legislation of any sort. I mean, not a new environmental law in 25 years. But the good news is that we already have the enabling legislation we need, and it's the Clean Air Act. And I'm, I'm repeating this because I, it, it sounds so technical or sort of mundane that frequently people overlook the significance of it. They also overlook the significance of it because a lot of our leading climate activists such as Jim Hansen here don't mention it. Uh, it. It has not been discussed and if we're going to act in the spirit of harsh realism and do what we can with what we have I think we need to understand that and basically it is anything that some other kind of legislation would do the Clean Air Act allows us to do. It, it's awkward in certain ways. It's been tested again and again and again. The right wing is constantly throwing lawsuits at it and it's continually defended. And one of the main problems that has been in the last couple of years is that too many progressives and environmentalists got caught up in this fantasy of new legislation. I mean, Jim Hansen, who I have massive respect for, right? I mean, I'll say it, I, I think he needs to stop talking about this cap and dividend stuff. Could you imagine this Congress ever going along with that? Where you're gonna tax, pass a carbon tax and then redistribute the money per capita? It's not gonna happen. So let's, let's demand that the laws we have be used to impose a carbon tax on fossil fuels. Okay, I'm gonna... We'll, ha we'll okay, have a later gonna... discussion about the legalities of whether you could do that, but that's can another I, discussion. I, well, All right, can, questions, questions from can the Can I just yeah. respond yeah. to... Yeah. Go ahead. I, I would yeah. like to just briefly clarify by beating up on the Europeans here. And Mike, <laughs> Michael showed that um, the countries that agreed to Kyoto, and this would include the European community, did see their greenhouse gas CO2 emissions level. If you actually calculate the, emission, the, the carbon footprint of those nations, however, it continued to okay. rise. Yes. So yes. the countries achieved this by off, offshoring a lot of production to Asia. If you compute the carbon footprint of European citizenry, it continued to rise. Because more, but more of what they were consuming was being made in India, China, and other Asian countries that you saw had that big, big growth in emissions. That was a problem with Kyoto that left those countries out. And that's why we can't ever have an agreement like that before. But, it, but be aware that European citizenry did not reduce their carbon em, em, foot, emission footprints by anything like it looks like in those charts. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. That's true. Questions? Um, oh, I, maybe not. <laughs> um, I, I have a mic, but hello? Sorry. Didn't mean to supersede you. I actually had my hand up back here. Um, uh, you guys have done an excellent job in talking about the role of the state and the role of the individuals and discussed you know, the potential uh, impact that the United States can have, but I feel like the real elephants in the room in this discussion are especially China and the potential of India investing in a massive infrastructure build-out project this century. Can you please maybe address within your different roles um, the more specifics of the nature of government and individuals in these two countries, which are gonna be the real forces in potentially altering climate change, um, and especially how almost their domestic policies 
are now going to have a great international impact. Well, uh, China and India have obviously fundamentally different political and governance systems. And uh, China, the growth of uh, domestic air pollution uh, uh, has led to uh, such enormous health problems and such political problems that the central government is quite committed to uh, reducing it. And those uh, pollutants tend to come from the same major sources as greenhouse gases. So China, I think, is taking it uh, very seriously. India is a completely different uh, situation. The air in some of their cities is just as bad or worse than in, um, uh, in China. Uh, they, uh, they do not have a central government that has anywhere close to the power of the central Chinese government, and their per capita emissions are immensely lower. So it's very hard for uh, us uh, in, in New York to uh, point to, to wag our fingers at them because our uh, per capita emissions are so much higher. Um, the position of the Indian government seems to be, it's a little hard to figure out from day to day, but seems to be that they are happy to install a clean energy economy if the Global North pays for it. Uh, the Global North is not eager to do that, and so uh, I fear that we'll have uh, a great deal of emissions growth in China and in, in, in India in the years to come, which is going to make it very, very hard to achieve our global objectives. Okay, we have, to, we have to get beyond our own national s stalemate. But, I was, but rather than thinking of either nation, state, or local, some thinkers have proposed trying to promote uh, coalitions of eco-zones, mm -hmm. transnational associations, fraternities, of those who share the same sort of eco-zone, climatolo climatological challenges. Have any of you read, thought about that? Yeah, I think that's a very important movement because it also generates a, a space where knowledge can circulate because we're also speaking here about knowledge spaces. Many people are not aware of the small interventions that can be made in their locality, et cetera, which have multiplier effects. So if you begin to aggregate people that confront similar issues, it actually is a very good uh, proposal. And, and, uh, and it, I think it is the kind of thing that could take off. We have actually, we have, there are a lot of people who are really concerned about this environmental catastrophe that we're facing, but they don't know where to start or with whom to go. So aggregation and knowledge spaces, to me, are very important networks, whatever language we want to use, that it's just not simply a country. Okay, the government, the state of a country has to deal, but there are many, many other things. Frankly, when I look at that level, you know, levels that are in very concrete and specific spaces, there is much more happening than meets the eye of those who are describing where we are at. That is not going to be the ultimate solution, huh? because we are dealing with massive problems where we need the states. But there is a lot of energy, and I don't see it always as intensely deployed as it could be deployed. So any of these sort of connective tissue is absolutely critical, I think, yes. One more, Sort of related to that, you know, there, it's not eco zones, but certain American states, state state policies are diverging radically, right? And yeah, the the, yeah. the right wing of the GOP has recognized that, you know, in the words of Jefferson, the states are the laboratories of democracy, and they're like they're you know, pursuing that aggressively. But there's also uh, some good stuff, like an alliance of eight states that includes California that are committed to actually electrifying large parts of the state fleet. And when you have California doing something like that, then you're talking about a significant part of the American um, automobile industry being affected. So that's another aspect of this kind of sub-national networking that can happen. Uh, quickly, I mean, going back to the <coughs> comment on India and China, um, <coughs> the Indian position, as I understand it, at uh, COP21, is that uh, they will make commitments about what percentage of their energy will come from renewables in a few decades, but they will make no promises <laughs> on reducing their fossil fuel emissions, right. as I understand it. They want money from the West to help them with the transition, but in exchange, they're not prepared to make any promises. That's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, which is different from China's case, as you said. But the one question, I mean, this is a wonderful panel, and I think uh, you both talked about, in effect, movements and things that could be done at different levels of abstraction, spaces. Uh, but 
when I look at India, it's, I'm from India, and know what that place probably the best in the world, is that it's one thing when the Indian government acts on a global timetable and signs off on a document. Within India, people are not actually all living at a moment of synchronicity. I mean, if you think of the horizons of expectations of their own lives, of states, of regions, of communities, it's multiple times. Whereas we're facing a problem that at some level needs global coordination. At, at some level, it needs an arrangement where some sort of global time affects everybody's sense of time. And uh, I don't know, you might have some response to that. I don't know how one goes about achieving that. Can I say something to that? You know, there are very interesting asymmetries. Though that, that extraordinary destruction that I showed was not made there, right? And so when you look at cities, cities are producing destructions, you know, which, which are not necessarily floating above, right? So this is a real issue. And that is, again, I want to go back to that, your prior comment. We need to find spaces, aggregations, you know, of different elements that are cutting across and begin to communicate. And I think, of course, governments can, can help, but I think leaderships of cities are actually one first hope. So you have mayors of cities finding collaborative and, and sort of learning moments who be belong to very different parts of the world, but they share, like the mayor of Karaki can talk, you know, with mayors who have nothing to do with, with the subcontinent, for instance. May I make a quick point? With response? I think it's a very important point in cities because we are going to be a, a, an urban species on the whole. By the end of this century, 70-80%, and most of these cities would be what Mike Davis called the planet of slums. Uh, so when I, when I think of cities, most Indian cities function because we work with outdated British enacted laws, which we only in, sort of, you know, invoke when it suits our interest to do it. Otherwise, it's kind of pure, adjust, what Indians call adjustment, pragmatism, the, you know, the city simply lives from one day to another. At the moment, there's a huge power struggle going on between the central government in Delhi and the city government. And with all the pollutions, the central government is extremely unwilling to hand over more power to the city government or more resources. That's a key thing, more yeah. resources. I mean, Bill de Blasio yeah. here is, exactly. you know, he's limited yeah. by not, not being able to raise taxes yeah. and, and yeah. You know, implement what he'd like to. Yeah, true. Happy note, though. All right. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope the four of you keep talking to each other and, yeah. Thank, thank you.